Uh, hello, everyone. Today, I have a very special guest uh, from uh, Hypercasual Publisher Sunday. Uh, his name is uh, Mr. Balaji, and uh, I have the opportunity to speak with him about Hypercasual games and more. So, uh, Balaji, hello. Welcome to my channel, and I'm sure today our viewers will be able to learn a lot of new things for, uh, from you. So, uh, can we just start with a small introduction about yourself? Sure. Hi, Nikhil. Thanks for inviting me to your uh, to your channel. And uh, I've been following your work. Pretty amazing stuff you're doing for the ecosystem in India. Yeah, like Nikhil mentioned, my name is Balaji. I'm the head of publishing at Sunday. Sunday is a very fast-growing, hyper-casual game developer and publisher based out of Hamburg, Germany. Uh, we are part of Applied Group. And as a, own, uh, as a whole company, we are owned by Bertelsmann Group, which is one of the biggest media companies in Europe. Um, and uh, my job at Sunday is to is to lead the publishing department, which means that we work with external developers across the world, uh, also a lot from India, uh, when where they want to develop the games, and then we help them publish these games to the global markets. Right? And I'm originally from India. Uh, I was I was uh, like I was telling Nikhil, I was I grew up in Mumbai for like uh, the first 20 years of my life, so I have really fond memories. I'm still very involved in the Indian e gaming ecosystem. Uh, mainly where IGDC, uh, you know, I'm part of the content curation team. Last year, uh, I helped launch the first ever hypercasual track in IGDC, which I think was went really well. And I look forward to continue working with the India ecosystem. And also, we just uh, today we got the confirmation that our India subsidiary is uh, is live. So Sunday will be starting soon. Its offices in India. Amazing. That's uh, really good to know. Uh, so, uh, Bahaji, can you just help us understand what are hyper-casual games? A lot of people are aware of, uh, you know, casual games, hardcore games, but what is this new wave of hyper-casual games and what, uh, how would you, in simple terms, define what hyper-casual games are? Sure. I mean, it's an interesting question, right? I mean, it's like really changing. It's it's evolving. Uh, I mean, the first ever hyper-casual game, at least I remember playing, was Flappy Birds, which means like single mechanic, short session, uh, snackable content. Uh, you pick up uh, when you want, you drop it when you want. You're not really invested in the game uh, outside the game. You know, they all started with the core gameplay and then and that's about it. But now... They've come a long way. Now you're talking about like games like Idol Arcade, like Moon Pioneer, where you know there's also stuff happening in the game uh, when when you're not playing it. So uh, you know you're earning money, you're earning currency, you're earning resources. You go back and then you have a better experience. So it's ever it's like fast changing and fast evolving. Games are becoming more complex and more bigger. But I think at the core, if you really want to like characterize hyper casual games, they're like uh, simple uh, and and usually one mechanic. Uh, you know uh, they don't have a learning curve at all. Uh, they make everyone feel like a gamer, even if you're not. Uh, they really uh, don't depend on your skill level. It's the uh, same. Uh, it, it should feel the same experience for a seven year old and a seventy year old. That's how we we say the player experience should be. And uh, yes, they are like snackable content and they have the ability to go highly highly viral, right? And uh, the beauty is. Anyone can make hyper casual game and anyone can play hyper casual games. Awesome. And uh, what, what is like the characteristic difference between a hyper casual game and a casual game for that matter? Depends on how you define casual games, right? I mean, hyper casual games are a subset of casual games, if you ask me, but most casual games, as you know it, uh, first of all, most hyper casual games are single player. Uh, casual games can be multiplayer. Uh, hyper casual games usually are. Uh, are, are uh, make revenue, uh, you know, through ads, right? They're monetized through advertising, whereas casual is usually a mix of in you know, purchases and advertising. Um, hyper casual games have a very short uh, uh, session length, usually anywhere between ten to twenty minutes. Uh, casual games are a little bit uh, bigger in that sense, or have a larger uh, session length. And then I think also um, uh, you, casual and uh, in casual games, players usually you have D30 or you have D90, you have D180, you also have like D360, right? Uh, hyper casual games now, a very small percentage of hyper casual games uh, go beyond D14, right? And okay. these are the major, major differences. Yeah. So, uh, Balishim, this brings me to my next question, which you have almost already answered previously. Uh, my question was, who can develop a hypercasual game? And you mentioned that anyone can make a hypercasual game. So, let me just flip the question a bit and ask you, what are the different types of developers that you've worked so far with? 
And taking that as an example, then we can come to the point that who can develop a hypercache game. So what are your thoughts on that? Cool. Yeah, at Sunday, uh, we work with a range of developers, right? We work with the, just a solo developer to a team of like, you know, 30 people. Uh, there's no limit to how small you can be and no limit to how big you can be, right? If you're a 100 people team want to develop hyper casual games, there's enough space for it. That's the beauty of it. Uh, we, we, we have successful experiences with just one developer who does art programming design all by like, you know, himself or herself. Uh, and so, what what depends in like is for example how like like you you define then based on your limitations uh, how big you want to go right uh, because hyper casual game is all about speed so once you there are tons of different ways you can come up with hyper casual ideas uh, and a publisher like Sunday will also help you because we have access to market data we have insights we have so much data and our one of our core principles for Sunday is developer empowerment. So what does that mean? We mean we give all the tools apart from financing the development. We also give all kinds of tools and data and learning to the developer to make their own decisions, right? Then depending on your, your size and your strength and on your taste of developing games, you see what kind of game you develop, right? And then you bounce it off to the publisher. Now, as a publisher, we, we have so much learnings. We can say, okay, this is definitely a no, but like if the answer is no, then we always test. There's never a straight S, right? Because the data speaks for itself. So, uh, so, so I would say like Fall Break, our game that reached US top number one is a very good example, right? It was made by a team of two or three people, was made in six weeks from like ideation to publishing. Uh, it was a simple game, one single mechanic, you push a ragdoll off uh, and for the maximum damage, very low art, like no, no, no big art. And then the early number showed like really high engagement, even with minimal art, right? And then yeah. uh, you take it forward from there. And now that size of a game uh, to reach the US number one is totally possible, even if you're a team of one, right? Uh, so that was the first question. What's the second question again? The second question is related to this. Now, I think you've uh, more or less answered it is who can develop a hyper casual game? Anyone, anyone. I will say I, I love it when uh, when I go when I go to India, when I go to Turkey, when I go to anywhere in the world. It's like because also the biggest advantage of hyper casual game is it, you don't need to make it in English. You know, you don't need big yeah. text. You don't need big dialogues. It, it can be a no text, no dialogue game, and so it doesn't depend yeah. what your uh, language skill sets are, what your vocabulary skill sets are, what your art skill sets are, as long as you can make this one mechanic fun and yeah. how you define fun is different. It's like different, right? For some fun can be like having a nice combat. For some fun can be like frustrating enough, right? For some fun can be like just ASMR, like doing the same thing again and again. Like how you define that fun is, is really up to you. And once you get that single mechanic right and you test it for a statistically relevant uh, audience, uh, you can just go boom, like it yeah. really doesn't as if you have the right publisher in place. Awesome. And uh, when it comes to the right publisher, right? Uh, speaking of sp Sunday specifically, you mentioned that you help developers on a lot of stages. So mm -hmm. what is it? Uh, what is the exact help that some uh, Sunday provides for developers uh, to create their first hyper casual prototype? That's one question. And the second question is, what do you look for in a hyper casual game prototype? Cool. Uh, so for the first question, uh, apart from we, we finance all our developments, right? So apart from, I think that's a must given like, because our teams are so small, yeah. you know, you can't have a cash flow issue on your head while you're in a creative process. So we really, I did, so we don't work with a large number of teams. We still work with a smaller number of teams compared to a average, uh, tier one, uh, publisher, right. But, but yeah. we really go. Put our back behind our developers, right? We yeah. just go all in. So we fund the development. Apart from that, uh, we we uh, uh, we obviously validate your ideas that you pitch uh, with data and say, okay, like I said, hey, this has the better chance to succeed versus this. So that helps you decide, prioritize. Because if you're a smaller team, you can only work on one or two projects at a time, right? Yeah. Then helps you prioritize which one to pick rather than like working on ten ideas. Then obviously the test, right? Uh, every every process, the hyper casual uh, uh, publishing is like really gated, right? First we so a lot of 
uh, publishers do CPI tests or CTR tests. We do something called IPM test for us. It doesn't really matter what the CPI is as long as LTV is greater than CPI, right? Uh, so you can CPI can be like fifty dollars. It can be thirty dollars. It can be eighty cents. Uh, sorry, fifty cents, not dollars. Fifty cents or thirty cents or eighty cents uh, or even like a dollar. Yeah. But then we have a way of gauging like, okay, this can be your best LTV. And then if it doesn't make sense for you, then, then, then we'll do it. But if it makes, if this much money, uh, maybe it's $50,000, maybe it's $500,000, maybe it's 5 million. We'll, we'll give you an approximate number of yeah. this is the maximum we think you can make in your game at the, at the, at the, when we do the LTV test, you want to go ahead or not, right? That helps you decide as well. For some people, it's like, yeah, it's enough for me. And for some people, it's like, no, we rather make our like million dollar hit, right? Yeah. Um, so that that is what we share with the developer, this kind of, apart from that, we have tons of access to tons of market intelligence. So we also are creating our, we already do it on a smaller scale. But for example, we uh, are creating our own market intelligence team, like starting like I think next week or something, where yeah. there will be a specific team who will collect signals from all different market sources like TikTok or YouTube or Twitter, or like social trends or like, you know, uh, ep- uh, event trends or like movie trends or whatever the trends are. Then also the mechanics that go with the trends. So we give you... Uh, these signals from the market and what mechanics can can uh, be possible for the strengths and then you make the decision. It makes your ideation easier, right? Then you, yeah. you bet on something that's backed by data. Uh, then, of course, during publishing, we provide creative services. We make the playable ads. Uh, we, we, we give whatever services required to scale your game to be a hit game. Um, uh, yeah, apart from that, we are working on few educational or academy initiatives, but that's still like under progress. progress. Okay. And uh, what, what do you typically look for in a hypercash report, right? In terms of, uh, you already mentioned your work on IPM. So could you also elaborate on the full forms of these? Because a lot of the viewers might not be aware of what is CPI test is, what is uh, you know, but if- uh, LTV and stuff. Sure. Uh, so when you first uh, submit a prototype, what we look for is how marketable the game is, right? Because when you do a hyper casual game, you're making it for the masses. You're not making it for a specific audience. So what does that mean? That means like, how how does the audience react to the, uh, and typically how you do is you make a 15 second or a 30 second video ad, and then you push it on different networks. We choose Facebook audience network because that's the best gaming audience that you can get. Once you get that, then we work backwards to see, okay, how will it perform on other scaling networks? So, so what you do, uh, we call it the marketability test. So the intention of the test is the same for all publishers. It's just the measurement is can be different. For some, it's like straight off CPI, so which means cost per install. That means what is the cost of you getting one install out of this game if you show this ad, right? Yeah. Uh, and that some publishers have a cutoff on that. Then there's a CTR test, which means a click-through ratio. That means how are your ads, how is the audience reacting to your ads? That means like how many people uh, from 1,000 impressions click on your ads, right? That gives a sense of like how 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 much the cost is going to be, right? Um, anything that's about from 8% CTR on us is usually considered good, but different people have different metrics uh, on that as well. What we do is a IPM test. This IPM is install per mile. So basically it's like how many installs would we get from like, you know, a thousand ads or a thousand okay. impressions, right? That's what, that's what we care. So we don't care what the cost is, but it's like we care about like how, what's the intent of this user? If the intent of the user is to, is to install, but and then, then it shows that, and then we make sure that the ad is not misleading. It's the exact same mechanic that the that the game will be. So yeah. uh, this is what we look in the prototype, right? Is there enough? Uh, the first stage is does it interest a big enough audience? Because for hyper casual games, you're making games for UA. It's led by UA, right? If yeah. there is no UA, then there is there is no business there. Uh, yeah. Then the second, if that let's say that passes, that the second is the MVP stage, as we call it, or the product stage where we look for key product metrics. And usually these are like D1 retention or D0, as some people call it, uh, playtime. Um, and, and, and then finally we go uh, for, we look at uh, over there, we look at also level churn and stuff, right? Because yeah. in the end, 
uh, the longer you retain the player and the more they play uh, is where you will make money and the more ads they will see, right? That's how we make money. Um, there also we have benchmarks based on like past data and then we advise uh, uh, the teams whether, okay, you're too far off, doesn't make sense trying, or it's like, okay, this is actually promising and these are the, ex- ex- these are the directions you can take to, in the end, we will never tell you exactly what to do, right? Yeah. Because then you will never learn. We will tell you the possible routes you can take so that then, you know, you also have a learning. Um, and then if it passes that gate, then it's an LTV test. So basically we, de- we put in monetization and see like, what is the possibility of, uh, what is the maximum revenue this game can make? So that's where you get the, uh, you know, the, at that point you have the cost per install and yeah. then you have the money, the money can game and, and the, uh, you know, difference is the profit you would make. And then you would say, okay, would it make sense or not? Yeah, and then if if all that works, then it's like soft launch and global release, right? Then we're just scaling the game, boom. Yeah, that's about so it. It is more or less a complete business, right? Uh, if you identify certain metrics and what works and what not. What brings me to my next question is, what are some factors that are responsible for getting a game rejected? So the factors for getting the rage rejected would be a couple of factors. Sometimes, uh, like my, I told you about IP marketability test, right? Let's say you have a, a bad marketability test, then then that would fail. Let's say you have a very uh, short marketability lifetime. That means you, let's say you have a IPM score of 70 on week yeah. one. In the next test, that 70 drops to 50. So that means your marketability uh, numbers are not holding strong enough, right? They're drastically dropping. And you as a team cannot make a game that fast. You can't iterate that fast, right? So that would be like a reason for rejection on on this stage. Uh, Then on product side, for example, you can make a highly marketable idea. That's why I personally would advise every game developer, every game team to ask this one question. If you have a great idea, can you make a deep enough game out of it? When I say deep enough, it's not for uh, hours or days. It's about like, can you engage the user for like 10 to 20 minutes, right? Uh, With ads, right? If the answer is yes, uh, then sure, go for it. But if you say, okay, uh, this is, for example, let's let's take an example, right? Uh, Let's say something about like, um some something that's like a quick fun or a quick laugh right i think there were a couple of these games where you like kind of semi undress the uh, play like the characters in the game it's fun one time it's fun second time but it's boring the third time if the yeah. whole game is just about like undressing people yeah. it loses its fun like pretty fast on and that will never be a successful game right because you need to hold the players interest for at least 20 to 30 levels, mm-hmm. and they need to come on day one, they need to come on day two, a subset. I mean, not all of them, but like yeah. a percentage of them. Only yeah. when you get that, would you have a good product in place. So obviously, if the product metrics fail, we reject it. But for you as a game developer, it will also save a lot of time when you ask this one basic question and actually can like be honest about it, right? And if you feel like, okay, I mean, you from your experience would know at least like, okay, I can never make a deep and good enough game out of this trend, right? Or yes. this mechanic. Then, yeah. then just kill it. Got it. And, Got it. Uh, and then the last is, it also happens when all these metrics can pass, but somehow the monetization fails. But in the end, if you're not, if your LTV is not greater than that, it can happen due to two reasons. One is the LTV has gone up like quite drastically or the ECPM has fallen down uh, from the uh, advertising side, right? So, but in the end, if your LTV is not greater than a CPI with a certain margin, then uh, there's no business case there. Then also we would kill a game. Okay, okay. interesting. And, uh, you know, hyper-casual games, casual games, and with the advent of, uh, you know, recent times, the, uh, the market has been extremely democratized. Google Play Store, Apple App Store are essentially available for almost anyone and everyone. So mm-hmm. herein the question comes, what is the importance of working with a game uh, pro- a publisher in the hypercasual space when, uh, you know, essentially almost anyone can nowadays make a game and launch the game by themselves. So what is the importance of working with a publisher uh, for a hypercasual game? Good question. Uh, sure, anyone can make a game uh, and anyone can release a game. 
but can anyone scale the game is the question right yeah. uh, that's the first question a, 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 this is like we're talking about like really really big money right we're talking about spends that range from like $10,000 a day to a million dollars a day right sometimes yeah. uh, uh, and i don't think uh, most game developers can afford to do that for sure uh, that comes the okay in 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 some countries in some ecosystems you have um, you have access to like credits or like you know uh, ua money for and and then if you can access that good but that's a very very small percentile that's why the publisher comes in uh, second is um your uh, ideation uh, your whole process right like for example i told you how working with the publisher can help you prioritize uh what games to focus on uh, help you get learning from the other side uh, can help you in your whole game so the whole that whole process right you do it on your own you figure it on your own it takes a long time again you're like burning money there and wasting yeah. time right that's the second and the third uh, and the, and the third most important thing is also very expensive to test like for sure you can run a $20 test or a $10 test but you will not get enough data i mean that's not statistical relevance right to get a data that has real statistical relevance you need to run larger tests right each test would be anywhere between 500 to 1000 dollars versus for us like and now imagine doing this across 10 games yeah. without the return on investment uh can can everyone afford it? That's a question, right? So these are the three things I would say, like where a publisher comes in. Awesome, Balaji, that was a really great insights sharing uh, from your side. So as we end the interview, I just want uh, you to answer one question. Any advice for hyper casual game developers? <laughs> cool. Yeah, I mean, apart from uh, I would say, like yeah, really, really. Um, respect the data right i mean a lot of developers get stuck on the ideas and say like hey you know this is my baby this you know this is the best idea in the world in the end if the market doesn't validate that it's it doesn't matter sure it is a good idea sure it's a nice idea so i would say learn to uh, read the data well uh, uh, and then there also you can ask publisher like what does this data mean like work with game and and there's tons of tools available right start with game analytics from day one and, uh, and there's tons of material out there, but also if you're working with the publisher, you can say, how do I, how do I analyze my level churn data? What does this mean? You know, that leads to, okay, how do I make my next decisions based on this? That, that, that would be one. Um, second is, uh, in your ideation as well, I personally feel don't go for very short seasonal trends, right? Because they, they, die as fast some die as fast as they come and then there's usually very very high compet uh, 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 competition when it comes to games that's made on trends because thousands of people are trying that uh so i would say if you're new stay away from that crowd uh from that mat rush uh focus on something uh that's that's like uh you know that stands out something that's not part of that huge uh rush mat rush right then the third thing i would say like um like think about think about innovation in a very practical manner uh, a hyper casual audience or mobile game audience uh, don't like big learning curves so if you're coming up with a mechanic that is super new but hard to master uh, 99.99% it will fail right uh, doesn't mean you have to copy or clone right cloning also fails because the public is uh, so the consumers are tired of seeing the same kind of games uh, so many times so uh, get inspired but like try to create your own signature right uh, and if you're a gamer uh, ideas can come from anywhere the best ideas sometimes come from like old arcade titles or if you're making pc if you're playing pc games it can be abstract of some game right like moon pioneer was a good example just an abstract of like colonizing mars or something right i mean there's so many games that can be an abstract of like bigger games that you personally love and who, if you can make that accessible, understandable, and easier for the large amount of mobile audience, uh, I think you have got you would get your hit game like someday. Awesome, uh, Balaji, thanks. Uh, I think you have got you would insight, and uh, thank you for taking your time to speak with me and to the audience. I hope you all have enjoyed uh, this session, and uh, I hope you guys uh, took away something. If you want to get in touch with Sunday as a publisher, all the details are mentioned in the description. 
check them out and they are uh, really great people to work with i can say this by experience because we at kevna studios are also testing out some of our uh, prototypes with uh, sante uh, so thanks a lot balaji and uh, hope you guys enjoyed this session if you like this video press the like button and if you have something to say and uh, use the comment section uh, let me know your thoughts that's it for this video see you in the next one take care thanks nagel thanks for inviting me are dost ruko 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 kya aap game developer banna chahte ho यार मेरे पास आपके लिए एक बहुत ही बढ़िया बुक है मैंने एक बुक लिखी है गेम डेवलपमेंट 101 इसके अंदर आपके सारे डाउट्स रिलेटेड टू गेम डेवलपमेंट आंसर किए हैं मैंने तो अगर आपको इंटरेस्ट है तो अभी ये बुक अमेजोन के ऊपर अवेलेबल है जाइए इसको खरीद लीजिए एंड थैंक यू